Well, good afternoon. My name is Paulo Sotero. I'm the director of the Brazil Institute here at the center. Uh, on behalf of Jeff Dabelko, my colleague from the Environmental Change and Security Program and on the Brazil Institute, I'd like to wa welcome all of you here for one more uh, discussion on the series uh, Managing the Planet that uh, we have been doing in collaboration with George Mason University uh, for a number of months now. Our mentor and great friend in this series and a member of the advisory board for the Brazil Institute, uh, uh, Tom Lovejoy, unfortunately, uh, cannot be here with us today, but we have uh, the great honor uh, to have uh, Paul Schopp, uh, who is the pro Professor of Oceanography, Assistant, Associate Dean for Research and Computing at the University, George Mason University. And uh, I would like to ask Paul to introduce our speaker and our discussant for this afternoon on the very important topic of the Global Environmental Facility at the ripe age of 20. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Apollo. Um, yes, Tom uh, was so looking forward to uh, to this uh, session, and, and was so uh, sorry that uh, he can't can't be here today. Um, the The series managing our planet is uh, an idea that uh, Tom and, and and colleagues at the university um, came up with as a uh, as a key. Um, concept that the problems that we face uh, uh, in terms of things like climate and water, land degradation, uh, biodiversity, happen around the planet at such large scale that, um, you know, piecemeal solutions here and there are good, but we really need to find a way to scale up solutions to have a meaningful impact. Um, and uh, when you start doing that, um, how you're going to fund it, how you're going to sustain it, and how you're going to keep it going becomes a real problem. And the uh, Global Environment Facility has been doing this now for 20 years, working on exactly that kind of problem. And uh, today we have uh, current director of the GEF, Monique Barbu, uh, here to share with us. Uh, it's uh, past 20 years, and it's um, looking forward to the Rio plus 20 and life beyond that. Um, so we're very, very excited to, uh, to have her here and, and hear her outlook on this. She will give us a PowerPoint presentation and, and discuss this, uh, after which um, we've invited Melinda Kimball, a senior vice president at the UN Foundation and a long time uh, uh, expert on uh, global environmental issues, to serve as our discussant and uh, to uh, come up here and uh, contribute some further ideas and questions. Um, after that, we will open the floor for questions um, and hopefully have a good, uh, vigorous exchange of, of questions after the presentations. So. With that, I would like to ask Monique to come up. Uh, Melinda and I will go sit in the front row and get a better view of the, the slides and then come back up after she's done. Good afternoon to everyone. I was uh, trying to understand how it works. I am not very good at techniques, so I'm not used to do PowerPoint. I like better to speak without any notes, but I understand that it is better for many people, so I'm trying. Um, <clears throat> GF, uh, Global Environment Facility. Uh, GF is actually 21 years. So it means for the one who do the calculation that actually we have been 
uh, in existence a little bit before Rio. And actually, the countries which had created the GF created it a year before Rio with the understanding that all the conventions which were going to be signed in Rio needed one financial mechanism and that this one should have been in place before the conventions were signed and that's why GF was created uh, a little bit before. Uh, so, um, you are here, uh, the things that I want to uh, look uh, a little bit with you, which is the what is it that we are doing, how we have evolved, what is uh, uh, the institutional framework and the governance by which we are working, and uh, what have been our achievements. And finally, I would like then to maybe start a discussion of what's going to happen next, uh, what can we expect from R Rio, and what can we expect in terms of financing for the future. So, um, the mission of GF is very simple. Uh, we are an institution which has been um, created for finance, for providing what we used to call at the time new and additional uh, concessional funding to meet another barber word, the agreed incremental cost to achieve global environment benefit. So, incremental cost is the key of the GF. And what does that mean? It means that GF is not there neither to finance local environment issues nor development issues. What we are paying for is what it makes and what it takes as a difference to have impact of a global level. So, uh, for example, we do not finance energy programs. We finance the increment in energy programs which are going to give us mitigation of CO2 emissions. And it go this type of reasoning goes for each subject that we are touching upon. Uh, <clears throat> GF is also a club which you enter by signing in, so it's not all the countries of the world, it is countries which decide to enter the GF, and today we have 185 countries which have decided to join GF, and most of them are actually recipient country uh, of the GF. Our mandate, very simple, uh, we are the financial mechanism of the Global Convention on Environment, so the Convention of uh, Biological Diversity on Climate Change, on Desertification, and the Stockholm Convention for the POPs. I would like, uh, since we are here in the U.S., just uh, state what one thing which people do not know. Uh, as you know, the U.S. has not signed the Convention on Biological Diversity. But U.S. is the first donor uh, inside the GF and therefore the first donor on biological diversity. So for us, uh, the, the, the question um, uh, when it is put inside uh, this kind of uh, debate of uh, uh, political will uh, has always to be seen um, in a very uh, pragmatic way. Uh, we have, on one hand, a country which maybe has not ratified this convention, but on the other hand, inside GF, playing its full role as first donor of this institution. Uh, we are also, uh, inside GF, the only international organization giving grant at a large level on international water. Almost everything which is, for example, done for oceans is financed through the GF. There is no other mechanism in the world which is providing those type of resources. <clears throat> um, the, 
the link between GF and the sustainable development. Once again, GF is not here to finance the development issues of countries. But because we are looking at, again, this incremental cost, what it means is that we will always look at what is what we call the baseline project. And the baseline project is always a project which is inscribed into the development policy of a country. So the country has to show us that yes, energy uh, um, program uh, and clean energy program are what they call the baseline, and we can see it into the development program they have negotiated, and then we will pay what is it that takes the extra step to make sure that the benefit is going to be a global benefit. So we complement development programs. We are never a substitute of those programs. And that is why we are saying that GF is the best leverage vehicle uh, of uh, uh, programs to bring them uh, to very good environmental projects. Today, we have, for example, disbursed some $10 billion so far, but we have raised some $70 billion into our programs by building on this baseline to uh, the incremental cost. Uh, you have here a timeline of uh, the history of the GF, and of course, uh, if you are interested, this uh, presentation will be given to you. Uh, it's no use to spend too much time into that. Now, the way the GF is organized, as you can see here, the main uh, uh, body of the GF is what we call the GF Council, uh, which is composed of 32 countries, 14 from the developed countries, and 18 recipients. But with a system of voting rights, which is that to get a vote inside the GF, you need 60% of the countries uh, inscribed inside the Council, but also 60% of uh, the, the contributions, the financial contribution inside GF. What it means, it means that clearly you can't have a majority just with the donors or just with the recipient. They need to have some kind of agreement between part of the donors and the recipient to get a positive majority inside the GF. So um, uh, you have this council, and you can see on top of the council we have uh, what we call the STAP. STAP is the Scientific and Technical Advisory Panel. We are the only institution on a multilateral level which every single project goes to a scientific body first. And uh, actually today, the STAP is headed by Tom Lovejoy, uh, who has organized uh, this uh, meeting of today. And we have also a very strong evaluation office. Every single project of GF goes through an ex post evaluation. And then in the middle, you have a secretariat, which I am heading, but uh, for all kind of uh, um, uh, very historic reason, the head of the secretariat is also the chair of the council. So I am the chairperson of the GF on top of being the CEO of the secretariat, so which is very special, I have to say. And then um, the GF itself does not implement project. Our project are implementing by those 10 agencies which are being listed uh, below, but you will see for the future, we are opening up now the GF and national and uh, other international entity, as well as NGOs, are going to be in capacity uh, to present also now directly GF projects. Um, as I have said, w those were the themes uh, by which uh, on which GF is working. And again, except for the international water, all the others uh, are governed by uh, a convention, except for the last one that we have added, 
uh, at the last GF replenishment, which is the sustainable forest management, uh, which we have included as a new um, thematic area of GF work. And we have been able to do it and we have done it because at the same time, it is at the confluence of uh, biodiversity, climate change and land degradation together. Uh, GF uh, is also managing the Special Climate Change Fund, which is a, a fund of uh, the UNFCC, the Climate Change Convention, the Least Developed Country Fund, which is also another fund of the Climate Change Convention, the Adaptation Fund, which is the Adaptation Fund of the Kyoto Protocol, and uh, the Nagoya Protocol Implementation Fund, which has been created uh, last year uh, um, at the last uh, con conference of the parties uh, of uh, the Biodiversity Convention. What is not there is that it has also been given to us in Durban this year, uh, the Joint Secretariat of the Green Climate Fund uh, together with UNFCC. So actually all the funds today which exist uh, linked to any of those global conventions is managed inside the GF Secretariat a way or another. Um, so governance we already talked about. We talked about the role of the Council. We have also an assembly which meets every four years which is composed of all the countries, uh, and it, there is a mistake, it's 185 member countries today, and it meets uh, again uh, to review general policies and approve of the replenishment of the GF. So GF, uh, although it is uh, a young um, uh, institution, has uh, been going through all kinds of reforms in the past, and it's still reforming uh, itself. Um, the one very important reform that has been put into place uh, six years ago is uh, actually the allocation system. Before that time, uh, actually we were financing on a first in, first serve. And what happened was that countries like China or India, which had a lot of capacity, we're getting all the GF money, as the poorest countries could not exceed GF because they were never uh, fast enough to come up with project. So we decided that it was not a good system and we created an allocation system by which uh, every country gets an allocation and the calculation of this allocation is linked uh, to all kinds of scientific data plus also income data. Also, uh, the big other reform came a few years ago when we expanded from three agencies, the three historical agencies were the World Bank, UNDP, and UNEP, to now 10 uh, uh, agencies. And we have taken also a lot of measures to make sure that uh, our project cycle uh, is better than what it has been in the past. And finally, uh, one big uh, other reform that we have done uh, has been to build the GF as the first multilateral institution uh, which is governed 100% by a result framework. So we do not work through output anymore, but only through a result-based uh, system that we have built for all our activities. Uh, key achievement, so 10.5 billions already disbursed, uh, 2,700 projects in 165 countries, and those 2,700 projects do not count the 14,000 small grants project that we are giving directly to civil society and community-based organizations. 
uh, you can see also in terms of big figures, 2,300 protected area, 634 million hectares, uh, which have been protected thanks to the GF. And actually it's thanks to our work that uh, uh, the target of uh, achieving 10% uh, of coverage uh, for protected area has been able to be uh, to be covered uh, for the last uh, conference of the party of the biodiversity convention. Uh, also, um, in s inside the the climate um, uh, focal area, you can see that uh, we have mitigated some two billion tons of greenhouse gas. Um, it's not there but the price of the tonne of carbons that we have eliminated is less than two dollars the tonne, so it makes us the cheapest way today to mitigate uh, uh, CO2 um, uh, emission. Uh, just to remind you, the price of the market, although it's very low right now, it's still about five dollars, and again, we are working on less than a two dollar uh, for those kind of things. So achievement which are speaking for themselves and which have been uh, very positive. But we are still reforming ourselves and those um, are the list of the reforms that we are now engaged uh, inside uh, the uh, JEF 5 cycle which are started 18 months ago. And in particular, the huge reform of GF is what we are calling the direct access reform, which is going to authorize uh, national entity, NGOs, um, regional organization to become what we call JEF agencies, and it will start already at the next GF Council, which is going to be in June, where we will enter uh, those uh, new, first new institutions and we think that in June we will enter at least 10 new uh, institutions. Also, um, so uh, two, big, two big reform uh, status. One is what we call everything which allow a better country ownership of our program, and the other one is what we call the value for money, so the efficiency of the system of uh, the GF. So this is the Jeff as it stands and the way we work. I have been uh, otherwise somebody who has been speaking a lot about the fragmentation of the system as we can see it today. Uh, I, as you know, uh, uh, and in particular when we were going to Copenhagen, there has been a multitude of funds which have been created. Just in the climate change field, there has been more than 60 new funds which have been created uh, in the space of one year. Some very small, some bigger, some very big, like the C CIF of the World Bank. And uh, you see, the problem is that there is not, there is not more money in the system than there was. So what it means is that the money is divided in more little uh, pots than it, it used to be, and it's not working to the benefit of, again, the poorest country. Because each of those funds comes with its governance, come with its way to uh, give money out, uh, come with its own rules, and you are having poor countries all over the world which have to understand and to decide what is happening. And my big fear, uh, fear is that actually uh, you are going to come uh, to a system which is comparable to the health sector, which is the worst today sector in terms of financing. Let's be very clear and let's be very honest of uh, what is happening. And as you perfectly all know, the decision has been taken to create this, what we call the Green Climate Fund, 
uh, which is the new fund for climate change. Uh, the idea, supposedly behind the Green Climate Fund, is that we are going to have so much money in the system that the little GF cannot do it by itself, and you need uh, something uh, coming on a be bigger scale. Today, the GCF has zero uh, dollar inside uh, uh, the system. We don't know what it is going to be. Uh, you perfectly know, and you must have heard, like everybody else, that uh, people were speaking about $100 billion a year of resources coming for climate change, uh, which is, for me, a complete joke. And although I am a very public person, I am saying exactly what I think, and it's a, a joke for at least two reasons. One, because there will never be $100 billion a year running for those, those type of uh, programs. And the second is that I challenge anybody, if there was $100 billion a year, to tell me how they're going to spend it, especially if you are speaking about putting the money in the poorest country of the world, where there is absolutely no capacity even to take <coughs> one uh, percent of that resources out. So, but anyway, uh, the idea is not to try to be uh, on the ground. Uh, we are in a system today in the environmental sector where you have to add and to add billions to billions which do not exist and which do not materialize. So, very worrisome path. And I hope that maybe following Rio, uh, we will be able to come back to a better understanding of what the reality is and what is it uh, that we are expecting. As far as um, I am concerned, and um, I have put down our proposition, uh, which is uh, to say that there should be some order put uh, in the financing uh, sector of all the environmental questions. As you know, uh, Rio is going to be talking about governance uh, in, in, um, in most of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the days, at least, that uh, are going to be there. there. There are two items, actually, of discussion normally in Rio. One is the governance, and the other one is the green economy. And in the governance, I, the people are really uh, actually um, spending most of the time discussing whether there is a need or not of a new uh, international organization which uh, should replace UNEP and become some kind of world environment organization. Well. It might be a discussion that people need to have, but I do think that the other one, which should be there and is not yet inscribed, is what is it that you want to build as a financial system uh, for the environment? Uh, as far uh, as we are concerned in GF with all the experience that we have now, uh, what we were thinking is that actually you we're in the need of building what we call a fund of fund today, which is a place where all the funding flows will be known and will be directed by a steering committee at the highest level possible to make sure that the resources are going to the fields of activities which need it and to the type of programs that need also the resources. And then this money could be flying into different funds if the, the, the it is clear that uh, they will follow the strategy which have been defined uh, by uh, the governance of what we call the fund of fund. But in the long term, the only thing that could make a real difference is actually the creation of what we call the Green Bank. 
Why? Because um, if you, you really want to uh, achieve a large level of financing, there is no way that it can only be by grant system that you will do it. Why? Because the donors will never be in a position to put all that grant which is uh, required. And second, because there are all kinds of cases where actually you don't need to put a grant, but the soft loans could perfectly do it. And so it will be much, much more cost efficient, much, much more cheaper for everybody if uh, we were uh, um, trying to design uh, this green bank which will have different windows in which in every single of those windows, of course, the different issues could be uh, treated. You could have one for biodiversity, one for mitigation in climate change, one for adaptation, and all those different windows could even have a different type of governance. And again, simply on the top, you will have a board of that bank which will give the, the general lines of what should be done and what is expect expected from the different window. So this is um, uh, what we are trying to, um, to explain uh, inside the GF. But unfortunately today, uh, we are uh, into a syndrome uh, by which every institution think it might have the luck to get a new fund installed. And so everybody likes better to have a small fund, but that is going to manage than to think of the bigger picture and try uh, to get uh, the, the full analysis of what could be uh, a real uh, financial structure uh, which could uh, help really um, uh, in the long term uh, deal with all those questions. Also, it's the only way by which uh, you can open really the governance also structure to the private sector, which is totally absent today uh, of uh, the environmental uh, question. And uh, clearly, if you want to go anywhere close to those $100 billion that people have been speaking about, there is no way that it can be achieved if uh, somehow the private sector does not think that he has a role to play into the system. And today, there is no place for the private system in the way the governance is being built into all those questions uh, of uh, environment finance. So I think I will stop it uh, to this. I'm sure that with my last comments, there will be all kind of discussion that may arise. And I am now giving the floor to Melinda Kimball. Thank you. Thanks, Monique. I'm very glad to be here and comment briefly on this expose of yours. And I'd just like to start this by saying Monique knows whereof she speaks because she was present, so to speak, at the creation. In fact, we engaged early on in the effort to structure the JEF after its pilot phase. The JEF is an extremely important tool that the United that the world community put in place after Rio. It hasn't worked perfectly, but it's had some very important successes. First of all, it's developed and actually expanded on the idea of leveraging funds with grant money. And where the Jeff has been notably successful 
it's had developing countries come to the table with a particular sector project that the Jeff money could take beyond the original goal. I think that's very exceptional and very important and very vital to keep in the mix of finance. The Jeff was the first fund to take on this beneficiary donor governance structure where you had to have a double majority. The second innovative mechanism, I hate to get to the sector, Monique is so fond of the health sector, uh, was the Global Fund on AIDS, TB, and Malaria. And our goal for the Global Fund on AIDS, TB, and Malaria was $10 billion a year, donor and beneficiary governance. And the only difference in the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria is you had private sector and private philanthropies at the table. This did not work quite as beneficiary countries expected. And I put this right out there because we know from all our work with the Jeff that it's not mobilizing sufficient resources to take us to scale on sustainable development or within the very well-defined frameworks, water, climate change, land degradation, and biodiversity and chemicals that the Jeff funds. I mean, each one of these is a major challenge. So just like what we saw in the Global Fund, we have not been able to raise, again in the Jeff, the level of resources that challenges demand to accelerate our efforts. The private sector in the Global Fund has come to the table with discrete support, including a lot of in-kind support to setting up the Global Fund. But it's never assumed the vision beneficiary countries in particular had for the private sector, which is the Global Fund would be one-third governments, one-third private foundations, and one-third private corporations. And why is that? Because the private sector doesn't give money away. They come to the table with a need for return on investment to really mobilize the kind of money we require for scalable transformation. And I would say that's why we have moved in this conversation from Rio 1992 to Rio 2012 to this discussion of the green economy. Because if we don't find a way to make the low carbon and low resource transition sustainable and part of global economic investment, we will not make that transition effectively. The Jeff has been a fabulous experiment and I particularly want to commend the shift to um, country implementation. 
because I think one of the delay factors, as you saw in Monique's slide, is the transaction costs of having a financing agency, implementation agencies, and governments all with varying priorities trying to solve these big problems. And I say that coming from the perspective of a foundation that was an early partner with the Jeff on small grants programs run by UNDP, primarily for biodiversity. And secondly, for coral reefs, which is still a major challenge. <coughs> and the fact that we don't have somebody doing water, oceans, coastal zone management in, in the financing sense, the Jeff has had to pick up a huge challenge, but it's been literally one of the few funders with some private philanthropies in this space. So here's our challenge, and I think Monique has set it out very well. If you look at our vision for the Jeff and the treaties going to Rio 1992, we saw it as the financial mechanism for our new global environmental management efforts. And for all sorts of reasons, partly because I think climate change has become such a big issue in this space, we have not achieved that vision. But I think Monique's recommendations for a short medium and long-term strategy are critical to look at. And we should put those right on the table for Rio plus 20. We now have a system at the Jeff that is results-based. We now have the ability to move more to national execution and you will not get the change you need unless the countries own the project. And we also have a commitment around a fragmentation of funds that we should reassess and realign so that we are using the right kind of funds, grant, concessional loans, and private sector investment for the right kind of transformation. So the Jeff, the learning from the Jeff, the experience at the project level gives us a chance to grow a new fund of funds. That's a good approach that actually can serve many of our long-term objectives. I would say, too, the Jeff's shortage of resources and need to do shorter rather than long-term projects instead of programmatic budgeting in certain areas has constrained our ability to go to scale. But we are at a point with the upcoming Jeff replenishment, with the decisions out of Durban on the Green Climate Fund, and with all the learning from these last efforts to really take this another step. But we're going to have to be careful in our expectations of public assistance, public funding to this enterprise. And so results-based returns are critical to the challenge. So I think 
it's a great opportunity to hear what you are thinking about this challenge. I see some people in the audience who dealt particularly with the oceans challenge, and we'd very much like to have a dialogue on how you see this issue being addressed at Rio Plus 20. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Um, I'll give the, uh, the floor first to Monique to respond to the response um, mm -hmm. or, or uh, to share a comment here. Well, I don't think I, I, I wish to respond. I, I, I agree with uh, what Melinda has been saying. I mean, uh, that clearly today uh, we have to go a step further and that the thinking is not finished. It's the least we can say. But uh, at the same time, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, we, we, we have to also to acknowledge what we can do and what we cannot do and stop, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, exactly, <coughs> stop uh, 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 saying and, and, and making people believe that we can deliver more than what is possible. Okay, um, well, let's uh, open this to the audience. We have microphones around that will come when we select you. And if you would please identify yourself um, and go from there. Okay, so um, let's start over there. I, th I think I saw the um, down about the, f we're coming. Thanks. Hi, Lisa Friedman from Climate Wire. Thanks so much for doing this today. And it's refreshing to hear someone speak very frankly about Climate Fund and, and the money. And, and um, I wanted to get your sense. There's been a lot of ideas, you know, about where the financing, whether it be $100 billion or far less than that, as, as you think it will be, um, will come from. And, you know, f financial... Uh, I'm blanking on the word, but you know, financial taxes or, or aviation bunker fuels. Where do you think the the money could best come from? How much do you think could reasonably be raised? And and also, I mean, you, it sounds like you think the I don't want to put words in your mouth. It sounds like you think the cl green climate fund is kind of doomed. And and I was wondering if you could, okay, speak more about what you think the green climate fund could 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 do and how it could be improved. Thanks. <clears throat> on the $100 billion, let's be clear. If you are counting all the money which goes to climate change, mm -hmm. you get more than $100 mm -hmm. billion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. This is not when I say the $100 billion, it's what I am just saying and what it is that we have to clarify to everyone is that there will never be a $100 billion a year going to one fund. Mm -hmm. That's never going to happen. It's very different than to say that there is not that there is one hundred billion dollars going to projects which are good for climate change. Even today, we are even at more than that. So this is where first that discussion on the one hundred billion dollars has to be clarified. So this is uh, what I meant when I say it won't come. It means it will. It won't come in one fund. Uh, just to tell you uh, wh why, I mean, actually, I'm saying that, $100 billion is four times the World Bank. So, come on. I mean, let's be serious a little bit. What is the institution in the world, anyway, which could deal with that level of financing? So, that is where I am saying that uh, we have to be honest on that subject. Now, where the money is going to be raised, and you are right on one thing, is that it is for sure not going to be raised through the budget of national government. I mean, uh, uh, $100 billion is also today the level of the ODA of the world. 
So if you were saying that for climate, you need also a hundred billion dollars a year, it <coughs> means that already uh, you are in agreement to double ODA uh, level. And clearly we are not going towards that trend. Mm -hmm. So we have to find other sources of financing. And I do think that uh, the, 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 the one that we should be looking at, uh, the most promising one for me is the bunker one. So the one on the, the, the ships uh, and that if countries really wanted to work seriously into that one, uh, it's something which could raise some $30 billion a year. So uh, uh, that one already uh, should be something we should be seriously working into it. But in the system, I have not understood who is working into trying to raise those type of resources. Mm -hmm. Now, for the Green Climate Fund, the Green Climate Fund, I think it is very important uh, if we want it to work that uh, the board of this Green Climate Fund, once it would be constituted, first, uh, I mean, agree on the fact, uh, I mean, of, of what is the scope of that fund. Today, when you read the papers at the basis of what, when you hear people, I mean, it's like if that fund was going to resolve all the climate change problem by itself and that we know that it's not going to work like that. And I really think it's very important that this Green Climate Fund, if it wants to have success, has to target against what is going to measure its success. Mm -hmm. And that is the first thing which is very important, to get an agreement of what is the target of the Green Climate Fund. The second thing, is also to make sure that the money which is raised for the Green Climate Fund is, um, is money that um, is predictable. And so the, the big thing is going to be also to see among the donors whether they will agree to go to a system like replenishment system, which is the only way that you can make something predictable because if it is on the voluntary base mm -hmm. and that one morning you come up and uh, okay and you have 50 million dollars and so you put 50 million dollars but tomorrow you don't know whether you will have 50 million or 1 million mm -hmm. then it cannot work and so the predictability is going to be important and the third thing which is going to be important is um, the programmatic approach that countries are going to be ready to agree to, uh, like Melinda was speaking about. Um, I mean, uh, the big thing is to know what is the low carbon economy you want to build and to make sure that countries are going to take the commitments that needs to be taken in terms of policy, in subsidies, for example, for energy, mm. okay? I mean, what's the use to keep on pouring money into certain programs of renewable energy if at the same time subsidies for oil are keeping on the way they are going, then you will never make the renewable energy uh, viable anyway in the system. And so those are the things, this policy discussion, which will have to be taking place in the Green Climate Fund. Mm -hmm. So if those three conditions are filled up, yes, you will have a Green Fund, which is going to be a very useful tool because it would be a financing tool, but it will be also the place where you discuss policy level um, uh, uh, programs. And mm -hmm. this is what we still need to know uh, of whether it's going to be possible. Mm -hmm. And one way that everybody is looking at is to know already by which country and at which level and by which ministry in each country this Green Fund Board is going to be constituted. And today, nobody has any idea of who are going to be the members. Even ourselves, we are inside the secretariat, we don't know. So, uh, so those are the, the things. Uh, 
which will give us a, a, a little uh, idea of whether it's going the good route on which you are going to build or whether already at the beginning you are putting it into mm -hmm. a trouble kind of a, of a route. Mm -hmm. Can I just, uh, one quick follow-up. What is the, um, you know, the Green Climate Fund, you know, what is the mechanism that did create it and, and you know, how, how, how you know, cast in stone is, is what's going forward. You're, you're talking about, yeah. you know, changed vision of uh, is it something that's really there or is it something that, that you have oh, yes, the it ability is. to oh, change? Oh, no, no, no. It's, I mean, the fact that there will be one if you were, if you were saying tomorrow morning that it does not exist, mm -hmm. I think you just can close the climate change negotiation. Mm -hmm. So that it is going to be there, it's for sure. It's actually a decision uh, which has been taken uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, one of the main actors of that decision was Madame Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. uh, who had announced it, the first yeah, one who had announced yeah, it. Uh, doing, yeah. She was the one, mm -hmm. and then, of course, followed by all the head of states. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's be clear, at the same time, normally, mm -hmm. you were having a green fund Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you were having commitments for, from countries uh, um, of a limitation of greenhouse gas mm -hmm. um, into, uh, into the production of energy and the rest. The problem is that now we have the green fund, but we don't have the commitments on the other mm -hmm. hand. And so, uh, so when you say, why do you put one and not the other at the same time, Many of the actors of the climate change negotiation will answer you that it is a question of trust building. So you put that one first, and then uh, you negotiate the commitments which should come. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's get back here. Mm -hmm. um, there. Mm -hmm. uh, Harlan Cohen with the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Thank you both for your presentations, which were very interesting. Um, I work on global marine issues, so I will ask um, how the Jeff could work to, exp to through countries to expand protection for the marine environment, given that uh, the world's oceans cover 71% of the globe represent 90% of the world's biome, and that marine biodiversity is under threat. Also understanding, of course, that a lot of the ocean is beyond national jurisdiction, and I know the Jeff mm -hmm. has undertaken work now in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And just to tie this into climate change through warming and acidification of the world's ocean waters, mm -hmm and into biodiversity through the loss of biodiversity through overfishing and other unsustainable fishing practices. Thank you. Uh, marine issues are getting now a lot of interest, uh, which was not the case, and that's also the other problem, is that you go a lot with fashion, you know. So five years, mm -hmm. uh, everybody is talking about uh, species, yeah. And then you go to oceans, yeah. and mm. then you go to land degradation. Mm. So, okay. Uh, and uh, for a long time, GF was doing international water without any interest of anybody. But suddenly, uh, since uh, a year and a half, we have noticed that everybody wants to be part uh, of uh, this uh, uh, international water discussion, uh, in particular oceans. Uh, GF uh, has put now a target, a quantitative target for uh, uh, achieving uh, protection of marine biodiversity. And so clearly we are by that indicating that it's going to be a subject by which we are going to measure our results. Uh, so um, we, we have an official not target on that one. But uh, as you have seen, we have also engaged ourselves into major initiative. Uh, one is uh, the high seas, and uh, the other one is the Arctic. 
And so those are two major programs uh, uh, in which GF um, uh, countries have agreed to commit uh, a lot of resources. We are talking of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for those initiatives uh, into, um, into the, 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 the oceans. But although the oceans is very important subject, uh, for us, uh, the, the, the impact of the work that we are doing into what we call international basins is at least as important uh, because it's all uh, the water that people drink, use for the, their agriculture, and uh, it is certainly one of the main cause of disruption uh, into a political life of many continents uh, when uh, you, you have a problem into water which are shared between different countries. And that has not yet the high interest of everybody, but for us, uh, we, we are very careful of not just going through fashion, which is then we should put everything in our oceans uh, water, but also to keep on doing the work on the Mekong, on the Niger, on uh, the Nile Basin. I mean, uh, with the understanding that working on those uh, basin is the best protection uh, we have for international security. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go to this side. Just <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm Laura Gainsley from the IDB. I work on the Jeff and the Climate Investment Funds project. Um, my question is, uh, again, on the private sector. I clearly understand your vision on the long term, when you present the long term and short term strategy, the role of private sector in the long term. But now on the shorter term, medium term strategy, what is it that the, the, the Jeff, in your experience, working with the private sector and all the funds, what is that we can do now to promote you know, a better um, investments, private actions in the future, especially in a government national ad process? Well, um, during Jeff four, so the last uh, uh, four years, we tried to put up an initiative inside GF, which we called the Earth Fund. And actually, we had to close it. And it's me who took the decision to close it for a simple reason. Is that actually the countries inside <coughs> GF were not yet ready because the Earth Fund was a, a system by which we were asking also the private sector not only to put their monies, that everybody agrees, mm -hmm. but also to belong to the governance. Mm -hmm. And this is where you see that there is a huge discrepancy between the discourse, the language, and the reality of what countries are ready to do. Mm -hmm. And the countries were not ready to give up uh, the, 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 the power in decision making uh, for <laughs> private sector. And so the way we build up uh, the Earth Fund could not work because of that issue of the governance of those funds. So we came back this time to a more classic approach, which is we have now an initiative with the private sector, and actually IDB is going to be certainly one of the most active uh, uh, banks with whom we are working uh, and that I have to congratulate you for all the efforts you are doing into, uh, into those questions, uh, but it is a more classic approach. It's what kind of partnership we can build with the private sector for the water, for energy, for uh, uh, ecosystem uh, services, I mean, those kind of things, but very classic mm -hmm. kind of approach because we have seen that for the time being, uh, countries were not ready to give up their power inside the decision-making uh, system of those funds. Um, Melinda, if you want to well, step in I, here. First and, and of all, I'd like to say I think the private sector 
actually does really well at making, let's call them clean tech investments, when policies are in place to encourage those. And we have seen efforts, particularly I would say, in Mexico, in Costa Rica, and some Jeff money has helped the countries do the right thing, but it hasn't been the kind of partnerships we're envisioning yet. But we, as we experiment with this, and I'm encouraged by Monique's comment, I think it, I think we do have to go back to a pretty classical system because the private sector, just like the public sector, needs this certainty of environment before they invest. Okay, so we're going to go here, here, and there to the next uh, group. Thank you for your presentations this afternoon. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. And Melinda, I think you raised the issue of coral reef uh, restoration and what you're doing. And so this is really a question to you and then Monique uh, as well. Uh, but going the other side of going away from all the many billions uh, down to the uh, the small project grants and, uh, you know, what is uh, the uh, details of those? And uh, do you have any examples of coral reef restoration? The reason I'm asking that, we're working on some projects in uh, Micronesia, the Solomons, and the Marshalls. But uh, getting funding for that is uh, very, very difficult because it's going to huge projects instead of, uh, smaller projects. I just wonder if you could address the, right. the small end of this. Well, and thank actually, you for we had very ambitious ideas for coral reefs, and we wanted to build off this global network where both countries and agencies like the Jeff opted in to support coral reef initiatives. And all this for our initiative focused on land-based sources of marine pollution, which are pretty much the biggest single threat, immediate threat to coral reefs. Of course, there are other longer-term threats like acidification. And I would say this has been our most frustrating activity. We have had some success in Mesoamerica, but it, it's because it's one so hard to get community planning and so hard to get the requisite policies in place and so hard to negotiate with all the stakeholders around both water and management of the natural resource, both the reef and the fish, that it's been quite frustrating. But I would like to say that if we would now, at this point, do an evaluation of what's been going on within the International Coral Reef Initiative, within the International Coral Reef Network, and all this work, which has actually been driven in large part by World Fish, IUCN, and other partners, UNEF. If we start evaluating where we are, maybe we would get more lessons learned from what we can actually advance at the community level. But just to go back to funding now for one second, what people have to understand in the context of development is first and foremost, most governments are the primary source of development funding, even if it's small. But if you look at the emerging market countries today, Brazil, Thailand, Indonesia, China, you find countries that predominantly invested in their development choices and leveraged both ODA, 
tools like the Jeff and private sector investment in combination. Costa Rica, for example, I think is a fair example of this. And when we're talking about resources, we have to understand that most of the resources will be domestic. And what we're ultimately talking about is, is those incremental investments and setting the policy in place for both domestic and foreign investment that will make change. And that's equally true of coral reefs as it is of other initiatives. Uh, yeah, that works. Uh, Bob Kozak from Advanced Biofuels USA. Um, Melinda, you said something very interesting early on when you're talking about the private sector needing a return on investment <laughs> or getting involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, if I could sort of, th this could be kind of awkwardly worded, I'm only trying on this, throw out a proposition. It doesn't what we really need to have occur if we're going towards a green economy or a green fund to actually get a different kind of accounting for the benefits of what we're trying to accomplish and also to account properly for the cost of mitigation of climate change that aren't in there. And doesn't this almost argue for trying to get the World Bank to rescore their loans for projects? And I guess I'm talking about you know, it just you know, hypothetically, you have a natural gas recovery project, and the ROI looks beautiful because you know you can recover it at such a price and sell it at such a price. But you aren't including the near-term environmental cost, nor the long-term greenhouse gas costs. And I guess I'm looking at you know, just recently where the insurance companies have said that natural disasters are increasing tremendously and there, there's this money out there, mm -hmm. but that hasn't been commodified into the cost of projects or versus, you know, a savings that might occur in the long term from doing a mitigation fund. So I, I guess, you know, my, my question is, is there, you know, is there any, any actions going forward to try to change the accounting for loans and cost and, you know, like even having different interest rates for, pro you know, it, it, you get a benefit for doing something that has benefit. Well, I would actually go back and I would say one of the big discussions under the green economy rubric is actually really looking at different systems of accounting for gross domestic product and production. And another factor in this whole equation is what you subsidize in the current economy, like fossil fuels, and what you actually tax in the current economy ineffectively, like externalities. We're not covering the costs of loss of species, loss of clean water, loss of soil. And this, this will take time to figure out. But, of course, the World Bank is running a big group on this. Actually, President Sarkozy called for this and set up a commission on this right before the economy collapsed, so nobody paid too much attention. But there is definitely an active dialogue. I would say we all know that embedding, or as Europeans used to tell us, internalizing the externality of carbon in our economy would change how we invest and what decisions we make. And I just read another study today that to get the right kind of transformative investment, you actually need a $40 price per ton of carbon 
to reshape people's decision making. So, yeah, definitely, we're not fully accounting for what we're doing to the planet. I'll, I'll let Monique uh, also respond to that. Well, uh, I, 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 of course, uh, share the point of view that Melinda has expressed, but uh, also there, there are all kinds of different works which, which are uh, which are trying to, to go to that, but, but it's not a new subject. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I am French, and I remember that this, this kind of accounting, mm -hmm. it's 45 years at least mm -hmm. that it has been tried. Mm -hmm. And it depends how the economy is. When it's the economy of countries is going well, you, you restart that discussion. As soon as the, the economy goes bad, you close the discussion. Mm -hmm. And then you restart it from new. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, I, I, I mean, again, I don't think, I mean, and we have all kinds of studies which shows all kinds of things. But until uh, people do not live it, I mean, uh, themselves, they don't understand. Mm -hmm. Here, I, I am a foreigner, but I live here since six years. The only time I have seen people really worried, uh, I'm talking about the, uh, um, changing uh, patterns and everything was uh, a year and a half ago when oil price went up very much and then people started to get nervous again now right now this is what is happening mm -hmm. and the only way you really change patterns is when people are really hit uh, into their everyday basis that's unfortunate mm -hmm. but this is how it works in the back and then we'll come down to the middle. Thanks, uh, Chris Herman. I'm with the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, one of the interesting evolutions of the discussion has been towards the need to integrate the response to climate with the challenges of water and food security. And I would like to add biodiversity. And there's been a penalty, perhaps uh, is too strong a word, but paid for segregating these themes and isolating them. I strikes me that the response to climate has its own externalities, especially in the biodiversity area. The banks, World Bank's response to climate, uh, the need for low climate alternatives has been largely large hydropower, mm -hmm. which has a spillover in uh, freshwater biodiversity and also marine biodiversity. Is there a way to integrate better the uh, this externality into the climate discussions? Uh, safeguards are not enough to address the issue of the impact of damming the large rivers of the world in the name of climate mitigation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> On that issue, actually, um, I mean, uh, inside GF, it, it has also been uh, one of the reasons that we have exposed to explain why we should stop fragmentation and building different type of funds every time that mm -hmm. somebody was finding an issue because all those things work in synergy at the end of the day. And so you need a place where you can look at those synergies because actually then you can also make the programs cheaper mm -hmm. because if you see them as vertical, mm -hmm. uh, you only deal with one aspect of the issue and of course it comes to a very high cost when you want to look at each of them. And uh, it actually, today, they the best way in the climate change discussion to enter all those topics is through the adaptation mm -hmm. discussion, not through the mitigation. Mitigation makes it very complicated. Everybody looks the transport, the energy, uh, the cities, I mean, whatever. When you look at the adaptation problems uh, uh, linked to the, to the climate change, then you are obliged to have a more transversal uh, view of everything which is happening. And for example, on biodiversity, uh, 
the best way to enter the item into the climate discussion has been into all what is called now ecosystem-based adaptation, mm -hmm. uh, by which you can enter a wider scope uh, of activities and the way that each of them uh, intervene into the, 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 the subject uh, of climate change. Okay, and then down, yeah. And then we'll go over. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, ben Schelk with Blue Legacy. And, you know, my comments are really going to, to echo what this gentleman was saying earlier about, you know, providing funding for smaller organizations. Mm -hmm. You know, clearly scalability is the primary challenge, but I think it's appropriate for us to take a step back and have a conversation about what scalability actually means. You know, Melinda had mentioned earlier about um, you know, criticism of transaction costs, and I think the same argument, in a sense, could be made of, of really large environmental organizations with high overhead and expenses and really a limited capacity to directly engage local communities. And that's why I think, you know, Achieving, sustain, achieving uh, scalability really necessitates placing renewed emphasis on grassroots organizations, the organizations that are on the ground in these communities with the tools and kind of the familiarity to, to directly mobilize, you know, communities to really address some of these issues. So, you know, I was really excited by what Monique had said about placing renewed emphasis on, you know, providing direct access for small nonprofit organizations, national, regional, local. What are some of the criteria, you know, by which you're going to, you know, uh, you know create new Jeff projects? Uh, what are some of the organizations you're interested in activating and validating in the future? First, uh, I, I would like to say that uh, inside GF, we do big projects but we also do very small ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, again, uh, 14,000 projects which are between 50 and $100,000, all community-based, 125 countries. And we have been the largest funder in the world of those type of projects. It's more than $600 million. We have spent in projects which are between 50,000 and $100,000. So uh, that we are doing, and uh, <clears throat> and actually, um, I always make it as a joke, but uh, it's unfortunately the truth, is that it is the only projects that we have that you can really see. You see, when you put $50 million into a, 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 a project, Actually, when I go in country and say, I want to see, there is nothing to look at. Mm -hmm. But when we put $50,000 in a village to do coral reef triangle, and I have fabulous example I could talk about, you can go and see them. And for example, uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, assistant secretary of treasury, US treasury in particular, who go in countries. And when they ask us for visit, it's always one of a small project that we make them visit because they can, they can touch the project, you see. So uh, that, <clears throat> I think, makes us uh, very, very uh, different from many uh, institutions. Now, we have two ways for the new, new um, work that we have started. We have what we call a very direct access and um, which uh, goes for very small uh, things by which uh, the secretariat directly uh, gives resources generally to the government. And now the other uh, one that we are going to start in June is uh, actually the enlargement of uh, the GF partners uh, and implementers. Uh, we have all the procedure by which we accredit uh, now those agencies, and it's public. I mean, you go to the, to the GF website, you go on accreditation of new entities, and you will find, uh, find everything that 
is needed. Basically, the, the one thing on which we are not going to compromise is the fiduciary standards. So, and that's where many of the small institutions are going to have problems to meet those fiduciary standards. Mm -hmm. But it is the thing we cannot compromise. I mean, the worst killer for us would be that we start giving money directly and that we have a scandal and it goes to your Congress here and we are dead. So uh, that's the thing uh, we, we just uh, do not wish uh, to compromise anything. Uh, there is also another thing that we have opened now is that we have said that fiduciary standards were not enough. And also uh, what is uh, important for us is that the institutions which come to GF for resources, direct resources, also present a set of environmental and social safeguards with which we are comfortable, which is that we don't, do not want to give to institutions money on one hand uh, to do uh, very nice uh, environmental project when on the other hand they do not respect a certain minimum of social safeguards that are important for us. But all those are spelled out. I mean, there is uh, uh, um, the, the, the full uh, policy by which we are going to, to open up uh, is uh, mm -hmm. on our website. And we have also now formalized an accreditation panel with external people, uh, which, uh, and this is the panel which will decide whether uh, those entities uh, are going to meet uh, our, our criteria. To be very, very honest, I do not think that very small institution can make it directly. The only way for them to make it inside the GF into that system is uh, to build partnership with bigger NGO, which will then be able to go for the GF directly and then partner with them for direct execution by the smallest one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm Sasha Kuoshima from US EPA. And I've previously been with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, have formulated a number of GEF projects and currently executing one on transboundary river basins. And I'd like to ask you in regard to, you have uh, earlier mentioned about the transboundary basin, shared basin um, uh, uh, information and in, in the, in the GEF projects. Um, I'd like to, to find out what is the direction of the GEF in terms of uh, of these projects uh, under international water focal area, because most of the GEF focal areas are in are somewhat aligned with a UN convention of some sort. Is there a, a direction towards that for the international waters, first of all? And another question I want to ask, um, I, I heard that the finance ministers are coming to the IMF spring meeting in a week's time. Um, there, there will be some discussion on the Rio Plus 20, a Rio Plus 20 breakfast. I was wondering if the Jeff has any particular agenda uh, to discuss with the uh, finance ministers. Thank you. Maybe to start by uh, the, the last question, I mean, uh, we are invited uh, to those uh, breakfast uh, or lunch, depends uh, of the year. So we do participate uh, with the World Bank, I mean, uh, into that. And, uh, but um, clearly, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, this is not, I mean, and also uh, uh, specifically inside the donor countries of the GF, uh, anyway, our replenishment, I mean, uh, our council members, our board members are also from the ministries of finance. So we are also anyway uh, in an obligation of discussion with both ministries inside the GF because they are uh, uh, inside our Jeff Council. For US, for example, it's US Treasury uh, which sits uh, on the, the Jeff board. Uh, the same for France, for, 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 for Japan, for uh, Italy, for, I mean, all my big donors uh, are, are there represented 
by the ministries of finance inside the GF. So that discussion uh, uh, is there, and I have to say that uh, actually uh, the people of ministries of finance, uh, in a way, are much more open than any other ministries because they are not fighting for one technical subject. So they're generally much more open as other technical ministries which would want always to make sure that what they are looking for in terms of technical subject is there uh, and maybe not taking as much care as for the rest. Uh, for the, the, the fresh water, I mean transboundary water uh, program of GF, we are not following any kind of UN convention. There is none uh, existing. Of course, uh, there are all kind of UNEP programs and others that uh, we, we, um, uh, we look at and with whom we discuss when we build our strategy. But uh, <coughs> clearly the work that GF is doing uh, in those transboundary basins is a, a job that is actually the job that nobody wants to do, which is that we are paying for years, you know, all the discussion, uh, sometimes very informal type of discussion, until countries agree mm -hmm. to sit down formally. So we are spending a lot of money in things for which we cannot guarantee any kind of result. For example, Mekong, we've spent a lot of money, uh, but clearly knowing that at the end of the day, it will make no difference if China does not sit at the table of the Mekong discussion. And so all of it has been to give trust to China, confidence that they should be there. And the day when you get the right partners, the right agenda, then you have all kinds of institutions mm. which agree to come in and to finance that the work. But the one before that is generally GF finance. It has been the same for the Nile Basin. We took the discussion for 15 years <laughs> before we came to an agreement of some kind. And so, uh, uh, but, but at the same time, uh, I mean, uh, we have done a study not long ago, which is now public, uh, about um, um, uh, peace, uh, war, and security, and international water. And actually, we came to the conclusion that, for example, in Africa, every single conflict of the last 20 years has been linked to a water problem mm -hmm. at, one, at one point or another. And so this is why, I mean, we, we consider that it is very important to, to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And we have had always a huge support from our donors, even when we had constrained resources, that this item should be protected uh, inside, our, uh, inside the GF agenda. John, the front here. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Brian Howard with National Geographic Online. Uh, I was wondering if your organizations have funding support for geoengineering. Um, will they, should they, how does that fit into the debate going into Rio? Funding for what? Geoengineering. <laughs> no, we, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, I, as though to back into the atmosphere. No, we <laughs> don't do that, <laughs> I have to say. We don't either. I mean, geoengineering is quite expensive. But, uh, you know, it's a challenging subject. Quick answer to a short question. Yes. <laughs> no, we could do it very, very long, <laughs> but we can do it very <laughs> short. And the yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have time for more. Uh, mm -hmm. Senator. Afternoon, uh, Dean Scott, I write for BNA here in town covering climate change. And uh, I just wondered um, if as uh, the head of 
Uh, Jeff, if you have any thoughts about the World Bank leadership and the candidates <laughs> that are there uh, that we're all looking forward to seeing a uh, decision on. And, uh, and if so, uh, what are the qualities of that leadership that might be useful for uh, driving some of these issues forward? <laughs> no. I am not candidate. That's all I can, that's for sure. <laughs> now for the rest, I mean, I, I, I will not, of course, say anything about the people who are candidates. Uh, it's not my role. What I know is that at least the current president of the World Bank, Robert Zelik, uh, has been great for both issues. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I mean, uh, uh, it's, uh, it, uh, he has been a very green president of the World Bank. You can always say that it does not go enough, that it could be better, that it could go much further. But uh, when you see all the kind of uh, uh, very uh, different things that uh, somebody who is the president of the World Bank uh, has to, uh, uh, um, how, how do you say? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Prioritize. Uh, uh, prioritize. Yeah. He has really uh, put his name, uh, his institution, uh, forward uh, towards uh, those kind of uh, those items, and uh, uh, if you look, for example, what he has tried to do to do for species and danger species, I mean, everybody was surprised why a president of the bank uh, will go and put his name forward as he, as he did, but he did it, and uh, the same on oceans. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we are talking here about uh, uh, oceans. I mean, he's going all over the world to talk about oceans. And so uh, if the next one was at least as good as Mr. Zelik has been into that issue, I think it would be very, very good for us, whoever it is. <clears throat> Hello, I'm uh, Ellen Shaw from the U.S. Department of State, and I uh, wanted to thank you for just excellent presentations and for really um, spelling out the bigger picture for us. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the uh, international financial world writ large, uh, going beyond the specific funds for the environment and talking about um, those funds, multilateral, um, bilateral, other sorts of assistance funds that really um, have nothing to do with the environment, but that affect it nonetheless. Um, you've talked about the Jeff and its its role in sort of topping up or providing incremental funding to make um, energy projects, for example, um, uh, to lower their, to reduce their footprint. But there's a lot in the world, as I think you've recognized, that there that uh, the Jeff can't touch. There just isn't enough finance for that. So there have to be other levers. Um, and I'm curious what your view of those levers might be. What other sorts of instruments are there to affect other kinds of lending so that they are more environmentally friendly, less, uh, you know, less um, impactful on the environment writ large? You talked about safeguards. Um, and that's one tool. I'm just wondering what, you know, in the in the world of the the Jeff or the UN Foundation or other international actors, what can be done to to um, influence, I guess, those other funds in a in a constructive way? Thank you. Well, actually, one thing that uh, we should really be looking at if we wanted to go on a very large scale is all the guarantee system of loans. Mm -hmm which, uh, uh, as you know, uh, even private banks, I mean, U.S. banks or French banks, whatever, I mean, when they do loans, big loans to a country, China, for example, mm -hmm. generally they come to a, 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 a guarantee through the state. I mean, I don't know what is the name in U.S. You must have one, like we have one in France. And those are always uh, uh, out the discussion uh, on all those items. And for example, if uh, those guarantee uh, system, uh, bilateral guarantee system, 
uh, where under the same rules that, for example, for example, the bilateral aid, like U.S. aid or French aid or whatever, it will make a huge difference because they are backing all kind of loans to all kind of companies uh, into uh, very, very many countries. And for the time being, I don't know why. N nobody has really touched upon them or pushed them uh, yet. So that's clearly uh, w one thing which could potentially have a very high impact in terms of how much you can then uh, you you can you can touch. Um, then of course uh, the other thing, but it's a taboo discussion for the time being, is all the trade issue. Mm -hmm. If you really want, uh, uh, I mean, to impact, the best way is uh, uh, the most radical way, at least, is to uh, put tax at your border. Mm -hmm of the content of what you agree to have as a product which come inside your country uh, of how much CO2 uh, uh, you agree that he can carry with him, you know? So, and, and that's actually the one which then you don't need any more negotiation of any kind mm -hmm. and, and will be the very radical one. And, you know, we, we are smiling and laughing about that, but in Europe, it might come to the point one day that it would be a serious discussion because, you see, clearly, if you take the situation of the European countries today, they, on, they, they are the only countries which have really taken commitments in terms of mitigating their emissions. So they have taken the commitments they are the ones who are paying on top for most of the system. And they have today a huge problem of employment, of competition, of competitiveness of their companies uh, into a very troubled financial world. How long do you think the population of those countries is going to agree to be the only nice, good one of the planet without any counterpart. And the day that discussion will come to that point, then uh, uh, the discussion of whether you need to put a tax at your border is going to become a serious discussion. And so this is something that uh, uh, I know it's people hate to discuss that subject, but uh, it's not because we don't like a subject that it does not come true. And that is why for me it's very important that we try to think before and try to see what could be good systems then instead of having one day a bad system being imposed because nobody had wanted to agree to have the discussion prior. But that's the, s the, the one which uh, also is a, a very high impact kind of uh, of measures well just to add to that i think it's critically important but hard to appreciate our whole international trading system is in great disarray because of our failure to push further out from the uruguay round and Border taxes are just going to be one of the issues. And you have two major sectors which are not truly well governed under collaborative regimes, and that's energy and agriculture. And both these sectors have financing arrangements that can be extremely distortive. Monique talked about the Export Credit Guarantee Authority of governments. That conversation around environmental standards has been going on for at least two decades in OECD, but it ultimately will become very critical, I suggest, in this decade 
just as border tax adjustments will. When the European Union went to Copenhagen, they calculated that the internal cost to the Union annually of their greenhouse gas emissions strategy was 180 billion euro. That's an internalized cost, which is now feeding back into the system in a very negative way. You cannot take policies that are so forward-leaning and then face a financial collapse and get everybody to be on board. So we will have a lot of challenges out there. And we have set up an international system really with the Marrakesh Accords and the Uruguay Round and many of the old agreements that came out of Rio 20 years ago. And all of that system is under very severe pressure. So going forward, all these issues will be on the table. I think we have time for one last short question. If somebody, well, absent that, um, I'd like to thank Monique and Melinda for a wonderful discussion. I'd like to thank um, Paolo for hosting us here today, and and the Wilson Center in general for its great support. Uh, making this happen, and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.